Warning, this is a series dedicated to the works of Jess Franco and given the nature of his films there will be mild nudity on occasions. I will blank out the more explicit stuff but as this series is intended for adults and is age restricted in accordance with that intent, it seems a little redundant to pixelate every shot of a naked boob or bottom. If you choose to continue then great. If you're likely to be offended by mild nudity then please find another video to watch. Thanks. Welcome to Francophile, an exploration of the works of the Sultan of Eurosleaze, Jess Franco. In this episode, we get framed and thrown in the slammer with the bevy of beauties bent on catfighting and avoiding the sapphic attentions of the warden. Inappropriate incarceration, torture, and the abusive attentions of the screws takes the stage in just one of many of Franco's women in prison films, Devil's Island Lovers. Framed for a crime they didn't commit, a couple are sent to jail run under an abusive management as an act of revenge for their relationship. A lawyer, Lindsay, finds out about their innocence from the deathbed confessions of the governor that framed them, and after blackmailing the governor's partner in crime, manages to get access to the prison to try to save the couple. Meanwhile, the couple are suffering terribly under the regime and are sliding towards a punishment that goes beyond solitary confinement. But can they save themselves? Or can their new advocate clear their names? Well, it's time to get to grips with one of the multitude women in prison films of Jess Franco's filmography. I have to be upfront and express the dread I've had for this moment, as it's a genre that I've had very little desire to get into, and with the exception of women behind bars and a few Nazi exploitation films, it's a genre that I've largely skipped over. But we're certainly going to be hitting a few of these in this series, so here we go with Devil's Island Lovers, aka Quartier de Femmes, or Female Quarters. Sé que se encuentra usted mal desde hace tiempo y que incluso se barajan nombres para sustituirle como gobernador. ¿Qué quiere de mí? Usted es Lindsay, el abogado. Sí, pero algo más viejo y más empapado en alcohol que cuando nos conocimos. ¿Aún lo recuerda? Sí. Oiga, necesito hablar urgentemente con usted. No pensará decirme que yo estaba en lo cierto. Sí. Esos chicos son inocentes. Si lo sabe, ¿cómo es que no hizo algo entonces para salvarlos? ¿Y ahora qué ocurre? Que usted es creyente y tiene remordimientos, ¿verdad? Claro. Siente que va a morir. Quiere dejar... The first thing that's notable about Devil's Island Lovers is that it does take time setting things up. In typical Jess Franco style, it's all a bit weird and convoluted too. Heavily built upon flashbacks, the story can come over as a bit confused on occasions, as it bounces from the present to the past and back again, with barely anything to mark the changes. It just about manages to drag us along as viewers, but it's a delicate process sometimes, that if you're not paying attention, you could miss the transition. It doesn't really help that the film also changes back in terms of what kind of film it is midway through. Though primarily thought of as a women in prison film, it does start out as a very different movie. And even during the prison related section, the story does occasionally and rather jarringly, not to say almost pointlessly, switch over to Ramon's story. I'm honestly at a bit of a loss as to why this part of the story is here. 
It does very little other than to show that he's having a hard time with it as well. It's not really explored and adds very little to the story overall. Talking the story though, and addressing a bit of the weird I mentioned, the reason they are here is because Raymond and Beatrice, our imperiled couple, are the subject of a revenge plot from Beatrice's wannabe boyfriend the governor and Raymond's ex-lover, godmother, slash adopted mother. Did things get really weird around here or is it me? Raymond has been carrying on with his godmother for some time, it appears, someone who he happily regards as a mother figure until Beatrice turned up. He doesn't break off his relationship with his godmother for any other reason than Beatrice has turned up and she's hot. She may be near incestuous and technically a child-grooming sex offender, but Raymond is hardly much better as he still seems to have some desire for her, seeming almost jealous when she tells him that she's marrying the governor. Pues que he comprendido que tienes razón y que nunca llegaría a conseguir tu amor. ¿Cómo puedo creerte? Escucha y verás. El gobernador y yo vamos a casarnos. ¿Qué? No pongas esa cara. O pensaré que te contraría. Mendoza siempre ha estado enamorado de mí. Y acepté su proposición. Así pondremos fin a esta situación absurda y nada podrá separarte de tu querida Beatriz. Ugh. Yeah, Ramon doesn't exactly measure up as the heroic type and considering he was running a propaganda shop in his godmother's house, he's not exactly displaying much respect for anyone including his current beau. Raymond's rather repulsive character aside, it has to be said that there's a pretty interesting story here, one of jealousy, injustice and revenge. While it's a shame that Raymond isn't a bit more, well, human, and less of a weirdo deviant, there are some rather interestingly nasty backstabbings going on. For the most part, though, the story makes sense once you get your head around this sometimes awkwardly deployed flashback device. It seems, in an alternate harder, though oddly shorter cut, the previously mentioned Quartier de Femmes, the story is more linear. It'd be interesting to see it in that form, though having said what I've said about how it was executed here, I suspect the flashback device would be preferable, simply because of the progression of the information that we get. It should be said though that this is a movie that does feel like it's actually made up of at least two films, maybe even three, that have been jammed together. The lawyer's investigation, the story of the couple before their incarceration, and the prison section of the story, they all feel oddly divorced from each other. And to some extent, the latter is actually split two ways that have little to do with each other as well. Somehow, it works well enough, though, despite feeling like a cut-and-splice movie. One thing seems fairly clear, though, and that's that Franco appears to have something to say in the film. The premise of the film, the framing of the couple... Seems important enough to Franco for him to have a stab at a political and philosophical point of sorts, and also important is the location that the film purports to be set in. Firstly, Franco does have a stab at being somewhat philosophical about the nature of crime and punishment, more notably that about the punishment. We know from the beginning that the couple are actually innocent of the crimes that have landed them in prison, and the expected ending of them getting away from the place just doesn't happen. It's somewhat of a twist, though rather a forced one, but the couple in their attempt to escape have apparently committed a crime worthy of the death sentence. Pase. Buenos días. ¿Quería usted verme? ¿Es el defensor de esos dos prófugos? Son inocentes. Tengo pruebas. Llega usted demasiado tarde. Esas pruebas ya no tienen ningún valor aún en el caso de que sean ciertas. ¿Por qué quiere seguir molestando con una causa perdida? Olvídelo, Lindsay. Eso parece una orden. Usted olvida que los delitos de evasión y rebelión se pagan con la vida. Esta es la ley y aquí soy su ejecutor. La justicia es rígida. Sin concesiones. Sabemos que los actos humanos 
son a veces más complejos que la ley. Pero hay que hacerla respetar. Sí, señor. Adiós. Franco does make something of the dramatic tragedy about this, though to be perfectly honest, it's such a blunt force reason why they must die that it makes absolutely no bloody sense. While a prison warden dies in the escape, not killed by them I hasten to add, it's a bit hard to swallow the way that the top man in the prison not only gets to dictate a death penalty and literally act as a prosecutor and judge, but the fact that they were innocent and tried to escape from a torturously abusive prison sentence does nothing to mitigate their actions, which at the very least were an act of understandable desperation. But no, defiance and an attempt to escape are an immediate death sentence without trial. The fact that they shouldn't have been there in the first place is irrelevant. It makes no sense really, but Franco was going for an injustice in the system angle that doesn't quite pan out. It all gets piled on too fast and by the end it's frankly given such short shrift before the couple are unceremoniously shot to death by firing squad. This is bad enough, but Lindsay the lawyer seems to just accept this with barely a breath of objection. They have committed the crime of trying to escape and been defiant, therefore they must die. And the lawyer's like, well, that's the law and I may not like it, but these innocent folks are going to die and I ain't going to argue the matter. Seriously, this guy just rolls over and everything he's done throughout the film is utterly pointless. Of course, that's partly the point that Franco is trying to make, and sometimes the innocents are wrong and failed by the law, but it's frankly such a bludgeoned-in idea that, uh, though the point is understandable, it seems quite ridiculous in how it's done. The suggested setting for this buys into the crime and punishment angle, though. The Devil's Island, that the title suggests, was a notoriously brutal place to be sent for incarceration. Run by the French between 1852 and 1953 as a place to put political prisoners, which is kind of fitting for the characters in this film, it was pretty much one of the worst places you could imagine to serve a sentence. The kind of abuse seen in this movie is small fry compared to the hell you would have experienced in this shameful piece of French history, though Franco does nod towards it. Devil's Island was also a male-only prison, so none of the naughty lesbian stuff could have gone on there. It should also be noted that the film is clearly not made in the real location. The French government are apparently reluctant to allow many people access to the place, so instead we get a big medieval-looking fortress. But there is something of Jess making a point about the place, this kind of place. Being a women in prison film, though, these concerns do feel rather secondary. This said, it is surprising that for a Jess Franco film, it is a lot less about the TNA than it would be expected to be. The film is still focusing on a female prison populace, and there is a lot of attention given towards the sexual threats and situations. But it is played down to the point that one may wonder if Franco made this film at all. To be honest though, the film actually benefits from this, as it's a lot less exploitative because of it. The film isn't exactly best realised, but it is focused on telling a story, rather than lingering on the endless scenes of woman-on-woman -woman action that typically makes up these films. For some, this may be a disappointment, but despite this, even though the film is very much flawed, it does roll along at a pretty decent pace, and the story doesn't feel too watered down. Bearing in mind that there is a harder cut of this out there, I would have to say that the scenes that I have seen of that are really not that much harder. This suggests to me that Franco actually did go for a worthwhile film rather than it being one of his kicked out numbers and it's a shame that it loses some points in some important areas. When it comes to things like the performances, it's certainly in the upper end of his films. Just about. Howard Vernon does ham it up a bit but that's fine. Otherwise it's all pretty solid, often unremarkable but not bad by most measures. Although it feels like a bit of a self-contained part of the film in its own right, the women in prison section of the film is actually rather well done in terms of how the characters interact. There's an interesting character arc for them, something which is pretty much something that no one else gets, and that's one of the more shocking things about this. The women here have a bona fide part of the story. They're not just a distraction from it, and the performances are, well, rather decent. 
The film has quite a short runtime, which explains why it feels so damned rushed on occasions, but it's something that does mean that the film doesn't get tiring to sit through. Overall, though, the film is certainly quite an enjoyable enough watch. Just about. It isn't exactly going to make anyone's top ten, but as women in prison films go, it tells a reasonably interesting, if slightly annotated and episodic story, without resorting to too many cheap tricks. Though for some reason, in the single most ridiculous moment of the film, the bad guys drag out a laser gun to assist in the torture of a prisoner. Hey, that's it. Y ahora qué? Vas a hablar o no? It's a strange Flash Gordon looking thing and one wonders if it wasn't just a prop that Franco had found lying around the studio and he thought, fuck it, let's go with it. It's a hilarious and somewhat suspension of disbelief breaking moment that took me quite a few moments to recover from but hey, that's Jess I guess. For a Jess Franco women in prison film I have to say I was actually pleasantly surprised by Devil's Island Lovers. It feels more like a film and less like a study of anatomy, and despite its shortcomings, it's just about entertaining enough to be worth a reasonable 70 minutes of your time. Tienes, Beatriz. ¿Te ocurre algo? ¿Estás cansada? Vaya, qué atenta te has vuelto. Será mejor que te metas en lo que te importa. Mírala. Pero qué picajosa. Parecéis un par de enamoradas. Calla o vas a saber quién soy yo. Sé quién eres. Lo sabemos todas aquí. Una cerda asquerosa. Estás protegida por la cárcel porque le vas con el soplo de todo lo que pasa desde los calabozos hasta el cuerpo de guardia. Cierra la boca. Si no, si no que ahora vas a ser tú quien soy yo. Toda asquerosa. Por favor, no te me quedes en la casa. ¡Basta! 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 